Good afternoon. My name is Tom Lindsay and I work at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. And welcome to our panel as part of our week long series on the 1619 Project. Our panel today is titled American Ideals. And to discuss this important subject, we are honored to have three experts in this area. Let me introduce them. Uh, first, we have Professor Kevin Gutzman, who's Professor of History at Western Connecticut State University. Next, we will hear from Professor James Ross, who teaches political science at the Helms School of Government at Liberty University. And last, but by no means least, Professor Joseph Fornieri, who teaches political science at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Welcome to all three of you, and thank you for participating in this panel. Thank uh, you. Before, before we proceed, I want to tell the members of our audience, there is a Q&A section here on your Zoom panel. Uh, and also a chat section. If you have a question uh, for any and all of the panelists, please put that in the Q&A section and we will try to get to it. Okay, beginning with you, Professor Gutzman, I wanna read to you and to the audience uh, as a prompt, a quote from the 1619 Project and then ask you to respond. The 1619 Project says the following, quote, the United States is a nation founded on both an ideal and a lie. Our Declaration of Independence, signed on July 4th, 1776, proclaims that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. But the white men who drafted those words did not believe them to be true for the hundreds of thousands of black people in their midst, unquote. Professor Gutzman? Well, I could write a substantial essay on the question whether the Declaration founded a nation besides declaring independence. Leaving that aside, I dispute the rest of Hannah Jones' claim. I take issue with the balance of her assertion, particularly in relation to the Congressional Committee that drafted the Declaration of Independence. From believing Blacks to be excluded from the claim that all men are created equal, they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, government are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. The drafting committee's five members had remarkably extensive records of significant official action in this connection. I will consider their anti-slavery records from the least to the most significant. First of the five, New York's Robert R. Livingston is known to history as Chancellor Livingston. Even on a committee with a Virginia Randolph, Thomas Jefferson, Livingston was the bluest blooded of the group, and his title reminds us of his quarter century long tenure as New York's chief equity judge. As Chancellor Livingston, under John Jay's New York Constitution of 1777, served as a member of the state's Council of Revision, the committee chaired by the governor charged with the legislative veto power. In that context, Livingston in 1785 opposed a bill to abolish New York slavery. Perhaps surprisingly, Livingston voted for the veto on anti-slavery grounds. The legislation said that, quote, no Negro, mulatto, or mustee should have legal vote in any case whatsoever, which besides foreclosing the possibility of voting for people freed under the bill would have deprived black New Yorkers already free of a right they had already exercised. Livingston is recorded having said that such people could not, quote, be deprived of those essential rights of holding office and voting without shocking the principle of equal liberty, which every page in that New York constitution labors to enforce. In further explanation of his opposition to the abolition bill, Livingston explained that it excluded these people from representation, quote, necessarily laying the foundation of an aristocracy of the most dangerous and malignant kind, mm -hmm. rendering power permanent and hereditary in the hands of people, of persons who deduce their origins from white ancestors only, though, these at some future period should not amount to a 50th part of the people. The second of them, Benjamin Franklin, though earlier in life seemingly having no object objection to slavery, came to oppose it under the circumstances of the revolution. So for example, he said in response to Lord Mansfield's monumental decision in Somerset that quote, the air of England is too free for a slave to breathe, unquote, that one of the great English sins against America was introduction of slavery into its colonies. He also, Franklin also, accepted the ideas in the 1770s that slave importation should end, quote, immediately 
and that abolition should come, quote, in time. By the time the Philadelphia Convention began in 1787, Franklin had accepted the presidency of the Society for Promoting the Abolition of Slavery and the Relief of Negroes, unlawfully held in bondage, which was organized by Philadelphia Quakers years before to help bring slavery to an end. As that group's president, Franklin presented to the new Federal Congress in January 1790 a petition for slavery's abolition. Mankind are all formed, it said, by the same mighty being, alike objects of his care, and equally designed for the enjoyment of happiness, and Congress should secure the blessings of liberty to the people of the United States without distinction of color, unquote. If the congressman missed the allusions to the Declaration of Independence in that passage, not yet as famous a document as it is now, we of course do not. Representative James Jackson of Georgia responded to the petition in the House that the Bible sanctioned slavery and besides low country plantation labor required someone able to perform hard toil. Franklin, the old man who had made his start as a teenage boy indentured to his older brother and writing newspaper spoofs, responded to Jackson with an anonymous piece in a Philadelphia newspaper in which an Algerine grandee after beginning quote, God is great and Muhammad is his prophet justified enslavement of infidel, that is European and American Christian sailors by saying someone had to do the hard hot work of tending the crops and the scut work of the cities. That men not used to slavery would not perform such labor, said the Algerine, that their lands would lose much of their value and the economy would fail if Algiers were deprived of slaves. There was the entire American pro-slavery argument in all its glory. Thus did Ben Franklin close out his public career. Roger Sherman of Connecticut, too, had an important career as an anti-slavery statesman. Sherman's Connecticut compromise in the Philadelphia Convention came naturally to a politician from his state, which at the time had one thirteenth of the country's population, thus would have an equal share in a house apportioned by population or apportioned on the basis of state equality. He also pushed throughout the convention for limits on federal power, which helps to explain why he did not side with those who called for more anti-slavery provisions in the Constitution. Besides, he said, the current was running against slavery, which had been banned or put on the road to extinction in several states. We do not know what position he would have taken had he foreseen that Hartford's Eli Whitney would invent a cotton gin that made slavery far more profitable west of the low country than it otherwise would have been. But we do know that Sherman, through his career, opposed slavery consistently. One leading argument of Mark David Hall's recent biography of Sherman is that Sherman's Calvinism strongly influenced his statesmanship and this seems especially important in relation to slavery. Sherman wrote in 1784, the year that Connecticut adopted its Gradual Emancipation Act, quote, that God hath made of one blood all nations of the earth and hath determined the bounds of their habitation. This hall notes was the passage of scripture most commonly adduced at that time in support of the idea of racial equality. Whether it was or not, he quote, that is Sherman quote, consistently opposed slavery because he believed all humans were made in the image of God and must be treated with dignity, unquote. Though his role in their passage is unknown, Sherman sat in the Connecticut legislature not only when it passed its Gradual Emancipation Act, but when it passed acts banning slave imports and freeing a slave seized along with the rest of a loyalist estate rather than keeping or selling him, as well as when it passed a law smoothing the process of emancipating slaves. All judges, we may infer that Sherman supported these laws. Sherman also participated in the General Assembly session that passed legislation empowering selectmen, the Connecticut analogs of town councilmen, to certify the likelihood that a slave would be able to support himself after manumission, and thus enable that slave's master to free his servant without incurring liability for supporting him in case he proved incapable of supporting himself. This would facilitate manumission. Two, Sherman was on the Superior Court when it decided that an owner who had freed his slave had acted rightly in doing so after the owner had determined to be a Christ, him to be a Christian and his slavery thus in law, unlawful. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of Sherman's, or instance of Sherman's acting against slavery came in the Superior Court case of Arabus versus Ivers in 1784. Sherman and his three judicial brethren heard Jack demand a writ of habeas corpus on the ground that Ivers had no right to hold him, he being free. Ivers asserted Jack was a slave, but Jack said that he had with Ivers' consent been enlisted in the Continental Army in 1777. 
as General Washington had ordered that, quote, the free Negroes who have served faithfully in the army at Cambridge may be re-enlisted there, but no others. Jack said, Ivers' consent to Jack's enlistment amounted to manumission. Paul points out that though he had enlisted, Jack had not served, quote unquote, at Cambridge, and so did not fall under Washington's order. Some other slaves who had served in the army during the revolution later were freed by government, but some were not. As Hall concludes, Sherman and his learned colleagues, quote, must have been familiar with these complications. And so we may conclude that they consciously pushed the boundaries of the law in order to reach a just decision. In other words, to free Jack. In another case, Sherman and four judicial brethren ruled that as he had been born of a free woman, a native of the land, a deceased Indian man had been eligible to establish residence in Coventry and thus the town's responsibility to support his widow and orphans. John Adams of Massachusetts, played an even more important role against slavery than Livingston, Franklin, or Sherman. Adams served as chief draftsman of the, Manumis of the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780, today the world's oldest written constitution in continuous use. Lifting language from George Mason's committee draft of the Virginia Declaration of Rights of 1776 and reworking it slightly, Adams included in the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780 a statement that, quote, all men are born free and equal and have certain natural, essential, and unalienable rights, among which may be reckoned the right of enjoying and defending their lives and liberties, that of acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, and fine, that of seeking and obtaining their safety and happiness." Unquote. The important change Adam made, Adams made was to omit of which when they enter into a state of society, they cannot by any compact deprive or divest their posterity. A, a clause which had been inserted into Virginia's version of this provision to make clear that slaves who were not parties to any social compact, thus were not protected by the Old Dominion's constitution, specifically by the assertion that all men are by nature equally free and independent. A recent account of Adams' life, Richard Bernstein's The Education of John Adams says, Adams from an early point in his legal practice, while Massachusetts remained a British colony, appeared in freedom cases on the side of slaves seeking freedom. He notes that in Massachusetts, quote, slavery did not start to erode until in the 1780s, Massachusetts courts founded a violation of the state's 1780 constitution, written by Adams. By 1800, not a single slave lived in Massachusetts. Finally, we come to Thomas, Virginian Thomas Jefferson. The most recent emerita editor of his papers, Barbara Oberg, said that Jefferson took more significant steps against slavery than anyone else of his generation. So we cannot in our spare time consider them all. I will hit the highlights. First, in 1780, he argued in a legal case that, quote, under the law of nature, all men are born free. Second, he drafted a 70, 1777 bill that would have enabled any slave taken to Virginia thereafter to become free, quote, upon their taking the oath of fidelity to the Commonwealth. Third, he drafted a bill in 1784, which failed by one vote, that would have excluded slavery from all Western states. Fourth, he wrote the most influential anti-slavery book of its age, perhaps of any age, including passages expressing hope that his inklings about Black's mental endowments were wrong, the candor of which is underscored by the fact that he hired Benjamin Banneker to be a surveyor in the District of Columbia, and the fact that he said his bill for the more general diffusion of knowledge could be read as applying to Black children. Jefferson is President Fifth, also called on Congress to pass and himself signed the law banning slave imports at the earliest constitutionally permitted moment. Sixth, he encouraged numerous younger men to oppose slavery, one of whom took the lead in ensuring slavery remained illegal in Illinois. And seventh, he wrote the first draft of the Declaration of Independence, or as he called it, quote, my political philosophy, et cetera, unquote, which included, first, the firm, famous statement that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, and secondly, a lengthy passage decrying the international slave trade as barbaric and not befitting a Christian prince. And actually there are several more acts in Jefferson's career that are of a, sim of a similar kind to these. So I think it's fair to say that Nicole Hannah Jones is mistaken. The men who drafted the Declaration of Independence believed what they said. In 1776, slavery was common. The American Revolution put it on a road to extinction here and abroad. The principles to which Americans were committed led to this outcome. The ongoing calumny against America's revolutionary founders who were born into a world in which slavery was widely accepted and played prominent parts in putting it, at least insofar as Western civilization is concerned, on a road to extinction 
might at first have been thought to be based on error. Now, however, with several prominent experts in my field having come out against the 1619 Project's chief claims as false, motives of leading it, the motives leading its offers to persist in making those claims seem clear enough. The 1619 Project, borrow an old saying, is in the streets. We of the present owe it to generations past and future to assert, uh, ensure that this attack on America is as it should be hooted down in history. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gutsman, for that thoughtful rejoinder. And just one thing I want to add before we turn to Professor Ross, I know that after receiving a number of criticisms from leading historians, uh, many of them of the left, uh, Hannah Nicole Jones finally responded that the 1619 Project is not a work of history, but a work of journalism. I, I, I'm not sure what that means. It seems to mean that historians are bound by the truth, whereas journalists can lie. Um, but uh, if you have a more, if you have a more generous interpretation, uh, I'd be happy to hear it. Um, next, Professor Ross. Uh, let me read to you a quote from the 1619 Project and then ask you to respond. 1619 Project says, quote, when it came time to draft the Constitution, the framers carefully constructed a document that preserved and protected slavery without ever using the word. In the text in which they were making the case for freedom to the world, they did not want to explicitly enshrine their hypocrisy so they sought to hide it, unquote. Professor Ross. Thank you, Tom, and good afternoon to everybody. I'd like to thank you all for tuning in. Uh, and I'd also like to thank the Texas Public Policy Foundation and the National Association of Scholars, especially David Randall for organizing this conversation. Uh, I appreciate your urgency in carrying on with this event despite uh, COVID and lockdown, uh, but mostly I appreciate your urgency uh, in addressing this historical moment. I think our organizers know, and I hope we all know who are watching, that we are here today because the 1619 Project reveals a loss of faith in the American experiment in constitutional self-government. The 1619 Project's central teaching is that our democracy's founding ideals were false when they were written. It is not an exaggeration to say that if the 1619 Project succeeds, the American experiment will fail. One part of the case the 1619 Project makes against America's constitutional democracy <laughs> is to claim that our Constitution was and was intended to be pro-slavery. The 1619 Project did not invent this interpretation of the Constitution. In fact, it dates back at least to the early 1840s when it was made most forcefully by the radical abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison. He is infamous for burning a copy of the Constitution during a speech on Independence Day. His critique of the Constitution was forgotten for a time when Americans were ready to heal after the Civil War but it was recovered in the 1960s by a historian and a new left activist, one who closely collaborated with Howard Zinn. The resurrected Garrisonian critique of the constitution as pro-slavery slowly gained traction in the academy in the latter part of the 20th century. And over the last generation, it has become accepted by historians as the central truth of American history. It was only a matter of time before the narrative our historians were spinning about the evil intent of our founders made it into the public square. So I've been asked today to address this argument of whether the Constitution was intended to be pro-slavery. An obvious place I might start is in the Constitutional Convention. But this has been done many times before, and I believe the more important and less known story lies elsewhere. So I want to start with the delegates to the Constitutional Convention as they returned home to support its ratification. They had been through 88 grueling days of contentious deliberation. The convention almost broke apart multiple times. Many delegates walked out before the end. Those who remained shared at least one tacit agreement. They were all more or less equally unhappy with the outcome. But with few exceptions, none wanted to repeat the experience of a long and contentious debate, and none held out any hope that a second convention would pr produce results they found any more favorable. They had done their best, and they would make the best of what they had done. Another tacit agreement they shared is that none of them said anything during the ratification debates to indicate they believed the Constitution was intended to be pro-slavery. Instead, many Federalists from free states praised the prospect of a congressional power to ban the slave trade. This had not existed before. They called it one of the beauties of the Constitution. They wished the power could take effect before 1808, 
but they did legitimately believe that banning the slave trade would lay the foundation for ending slavery altogether. Federalists and free states also boasted that the Constitution provided for a tax on the importation of slaves. This tax, they argued, may amount to at least a partial prohibition on that traffic. The power to tax, of course, is the power to destroy. So delegates who returned to slave states to defend the Constitution had to address this question about the security of their so-called property in slaves. There was no record in any of these ratification debates of claims that a right to property in slaves was recognized as absolute in the Constitution or that the Constitution was in any other way pro-slavery. Instead, in South Carolina, the, the delegates were sharply criticized for failing to protect South Carolina's slave property. General Pinkley, Pinkney simply said, we have made the best terms for the security of this property it was in our power to make. And in Virginia, when Patrick Henry claimed that the Fugitive Slave Clause was no security at all for slave property, Madison did not dispute him. Mm. Many delegates to the federal convention went on to serve in the first Congress. None of them gave any indication there that the Constitution was intended to be pro-slavery. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Convention delegate Benjamin Franklin was then serving as president of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. The society petitioned Congress to use the full extent of your power to mitigate the evils of the slave trade. Quoting from the preamble to the Constitution, the petition explained that many important powers are vested in Congress for promoting the welfare and securing the blessings of liberty to the people of the United States. The society argued that these blessings of liberty ought rightfully to be administered without distinction of color. Clearly, Franklin did not believe that the Constitution was intended to be pro-slavery. Nor did James Madison, who was also a member of that first Congress. He argued that if there is anything within the federal authority to restrain violations of the rights of mankind, it will tend to the honor of this community to attempt a remedy, and it is a proper subject for our discussion. To underscore his point, he asked, if Congress did have powers that could guard against such violations, is there any person of humanity that would not wish to do so? Roger Sherman was president that in that first Congress and had also been at the Constitutional Convention. He agreed that it was urgent that Congress consider the Quaker petitions in order to ascertain what are the powers of the general government to regulate the slave trade. Finally, Elbridge Gerry, also a delegate to the Federal Convention, though one who did not sign the Constitution and also a mem member of the first Congress, agreed that nothing would excuse the general government for not exerting itself to prevent, as far as they constitutionally could, the evils resulting from the slave trade. In the first Congress, then, we see the first efforts to find the anti-slavery potential of the Constitution. But we also see the first efforts to define it as pro-slavery. South Carolina's William Loudon Smith, who had not been at the convention, claimed that the Constitution was, quote, an implied compact between the Northern and Southern people, that no step should be taken to injure the property of the latter or to disturb their tranquility, an implied compact, he said. Smith's argument was rejected by the House, but it would soon return. In the meantime, Congress read and debated these Quaker petitions and determined that it did have powers to regulate the slave trade, if not to prohibit it. Congress passed a law in 1794 to regulate the slave trade, including banning the exportation of slaves. Congress strengthened this law in 1800, making it illegal for U.S. citizens to engage in the international slave trade and allowing for the seizure of any vessel violating federal laws restricting the slave trade. In 1803, Congress passed another law prohibiting the importation of slaves into any state that had made the slave trade illegal. And finally, in 1807, Congress banned the importation of slaves altogether. This ban took effect on January 1, 1808, as early as permitted by the Constitution. The first Congress, with several members who had served as delegates to the Constitutional Convention, clearly did not believe the Constitution was intended to be pro-slavery, nor did the subsequent Congresses which passed all of these statutes to limit the slave trade. This moderate anti-slavery movement of the late 18th century was joined by a more radical abolitionist movement in the early 19th century. But even these abolitionists did not claim the Constitution was pro-slavery. This included the most radical among them, William Lloyd Garrison. At the start of my talk, I introduced Garrison as the first and most forceful advocate of the view that the Constitution was pro-slavery. But early in his career, he wholly embraced the view that the spirit of the Constitution was anti-slavery. In his first public address about slavery, Garrison continued to explore the Constitution for its anti-slavery powers. He noted that Congress had power over the District of Columbia and thus could ban slavery and the slave trade there. More, as he co-founded the New England Anti-Slavery Society, the society taught that anti-slavery sentiment was, quote, the very genius of our country. The whole American people ought to be an anti-slavery society. The Declaration of 76 requires it. The letter and spirit of our Constitution require it. There is nothing here of the pro-slavery constitution. 
Now, Garrison and the abolitionists made provocative arguments, and they made th these arguments provocatively. Many did not want to hear them and sought to silence them. Some did so using legislative tricks to deny their petitions from being heard. Others resorted to physical violence against them. But the most respectable way of silencing uh, the abolitionists without getting one's hands dirty was simply to repeat the claim made in the first Congress by South Carolina's William Lawton Smith that the Constitution implied a compact between North and South and that according to this compact, the South would not have joined the Union if it could not enjoy its claims to property and slaves fully and without disturbance. This argument grew increasingly common, and by the mid-1830s, the abolitionists found themselves confronting it at every turn. Garrison and his colleagues were called before the Massachusetts legislature to defend themselves against the charge they were violating this compact with the Southern states. The abolitionists testified that nowhere in this Constitution do we find any such compact or compromise or stipulation as has been described. One of this group, Samuel May, complained that everywhere he went, he heard people talking about the Constitution as a compact that required silent acceptance of slavery. This argument, he said, was flippantly iterated by thousands who never read the Constitution of the United States. To combat their ignorance, he invented the pocket Constitution. Nathaniel Rogers, who edited an abolitionist newspaper, wrote that if the Constitution's framers had made a pro-slavery compromise, they did not succeed in reducing their compromise to writing. Instead, he argued that the written constitution was a warranty deed of universal liberty and that it promised equal and absolute freedom. The argument that the constitution was a compact requiring silent acceptance of slavery was based on speculation about what the framers might have intended. But anti-slavery interpretations of the constitution were based on the letter of the constitution and the spirit behind it. And importantly, they looked to the letter and spirit of the constitution as a whole including the Bill of Rights, which as we recall was added well after the Constitutional Convention and without any knowledge of any secret pro-slavery bargains that some allege may have occurred there. In light of the whole text of the Constitution and Bill of Rights, abolitionists argued that one of the fundamental principles of the Constitution was to protect due process. This was a principle they argued should apply even to blacks, even to those alleged to have escaped from, from Southern bondage. For this reason, opponents of slavery began to encourage states to establish due process protections of this kind. They had success in this task, but many of these state laws were soon challenged in court. The New Jersey Supreme Court upheld one such law. The judge in that case opined that Congress did not have any enumerated powers to regulate slavery, and that as a result, such regu regulations should be left to state government. Garrison took comfort in this ruling. He may have read too much into it in concluding that by the Constitution of the United States, no slave can lawfully exist in this country. But he did hope the constitutionality of these laws would be upheld on appeal to the Supreme Court. Opponents of slavery had reason to believe they were making progress in their legal strategy to protect the due process rights of blacks and in their rhetorical strategy of defining the Constitution as anti-slavery in principle. Their strategy was gaining momentum when in 1836, James Madison passed away. Word circulated that he left behind a complete account of the debates from the Constitutional Convention. Abolitionists were eager to obtain Madison's notes to build their case that the Constitution was intended to be anti-slavery. The first book by an abolitionist defending the Constitution as anti-slavery was published in 1841. It had mostly been written by the time Madison's notes became available in 1840. But evidently, the author believed that the notes shed enough light on the intent of the framers regarding the Fugitive Slave Clause that he added a section to his book based on Madison's notes. That section showed how Madison's notes had revealed for the first time that the Fugitive Slave Clause had entered the Constitution indirectly. South Carolina delegates had attempted to add a phrase to what would become the Constitution's Extradition Clause. They proposed adding the phrase that fugitive slaves and servants would be delivered up like criminals. Mm -hmm. Madison revealed that the convention rejected this proposal outright. Madison's notes showed that South Carolina tried again, changing the phrase fugitive slaves and servants to any person bound to service or labor in any of the United States. This seemed to demonstrate that the framers explicitly chose not to acknowledge slavery in the Constitution, but to show instead that slavery was merely a legacy of state laws. Madison's notes showed further that the phrase delivered up like criminals was replaced with delivered up to the person justly claiming their service or labor, and that phrase was altered further to remove the word justice and to call for persons in question to be del delivered on claim of the party to whom such labor or service may be due. The conclusion that was drawn from this drafting history, again newly revealed by the Madison papers, was that the framers intended to allow for due process protections for blacks alleged to have been escaped from bondage. <laughs> 
this whole legal strategy of defining the Constitution as anti-slavery in its spirit and as demanding due process rights for escaped slaves and other Blacks came to a head in the 1842 Supreme Court case, Prigg versus Pennsylvania. In his argument to the Supreme Court, the counsel for the state of Pennsylvania relied directly on Madison's notes to argue, as I just described, that the convention's debate supported the principle of due process. Pennsylvania's counsel said that if, under the Constitution, one can arrest and carry away a man without due process of law, the Constitution is a waxen tablet, a writing in the sand. Instead of being the freest country on earth, it is the vilest despotism that can be imagined. The Tawny Court utterly ignored this argument, and it utterly ignored Madison's notes. Instead of relying on documentary evidence to determine the drafting history of the Fugitive Slave Clause, and to discern what the delegates in the convention may have intended by it, the court held that the Constitution was a compact between the states and that, uh, one that the South would never have joined without the complete right and title of ownership in their slaves as property in every state of the Union. The court also invalidated the state laws designed to establish due process protections for Blacks alleged to have escaped from slavery. Garrison was crushed. He immediately declared there should be no union with slaveholders, mm -hmm. but he was in the minority here, even amongst abolitionists. So he began a campaign to persuade abolitionists to accept the interpretation of the Supreme Court in the Prigg case as the bitter truth. He told them that all men of intelligence agreed that the American Union was affected by a guilty compromise between the free and slaveholding states. He lectured them that the Constitution is not a ball of clay to be molded into any shape. It is not a form of words to be interpreted in any manner. It means precisely what those who framed and adopted it meant. Nothing more, nothing less. Still, his colleague, colleagues continued to resort to Madison's notes to advance their claims that the Constitution was intended to be anti-slavery. Liberty Party co-founder Garrett Smith said, whenever I read the Constitution, it prevents itself as a noble and beautiful temple of liberty. Whenever I read its preamble, I see the goddess of liberty standing in the porch of this temple. And whenever I read its amendments, I see in them the buttresses by which the builders of this temple gave it additional strength and glory. The Constitution's clauses regarding slavery, he said, were, quote, pro-slavery exceptions to the Constitution's reigning anti-slavery principles. He concluded, who can read the Madison Papers and yet believe the Constitution is pro-slavery? So it's here in this debate between abolitionist factions in the early 1840s that we see the origin of the 1619 Project's argument that the Constitution is pro-slavery. And so as I wrap up, I'd like to pause to underscore a few key takeaways. First, nobody from the convention, whether from the free states or slave states, said anything during the ratification debates to indi indicate that they believed the Constitution was intended to be pro-slavery. Second, many delegates from the convention who went on to serve in the newly established government supported using the national government's powers in ways that were anti-slavery. Third, even as the anti-slavery movement turned more aggressive with the emergence <clears throat> of abolitionists in the 1830s, these abolitionists argued that the Constitution in its letter and spirit was anti-slavery. Finally, it was only after the Tawny Court declared in Prigg versus Pennsylvania that the Constitution was pro-slavery that the most radical of the abolitionists, William Lloyd Garrison, reluctantly but decisively accepted the court's ruling as the ugly truth. Garrison was a minority even within the abolitionist minority then, but today his position is dominant in the academy and it represents the spirit of the 1619 Project. And finally, as I close, I wanna turn from these takeaways to a few morals of the story. First, we could draw the same conclusion as Garrison's colleague, Samuel May. Reflecting on this debate between abolitionist factions, he said, some maintained that the Constitution was and was intended to be pro-slavery. Others maintained that it was anti-slavery. It seemed to me that it might be whichever the people wanted to make it. I think Samuel May makes a very Madisonian point here. This reminds me of James Madison in Federalist 37, when he said the meaning of the Constitution would be equivocal on some point until it was ascertained by a series of particular discussions just like the discussions that occurred in the first Congress and in subsequent Congresses and in many free states until those discussions were closed by the Tawny Court. Given this, we should ask, why don't the people of the early 21st century, namely those responsible for the 1619 Project and those calling for it to be taught in our schools, why don't they choose to view the Constitution as anti-slavery? By no means would this require us to overlook or cover up the pro-slavery exceptions, which would and should continue to be taught as exceptions. A second and related moral that I draw is this. Garrison critiqued a constitution that no longer exists. He critiqued the Tawny Court's pro-slavery interpretation of the constitution. That court's reasoning has been wholly repudiated by history, and the constitution has been amended to ensure that the Tawny Court's error will never again be made. 
We can understand why Garrison may have accepted the Taney court's view of the Constitution as pro-slavery when he did, even if most of his colleagues rejected it. But why should the pernicious and mistaken judgments of the Taney court continue to have a place in our public discourse, and even the most prominent place? But finally, as logical as these conclusions might seem to, uh, to me or to my fellow panelists, I think they underestimate the appeal of Garrison's critique, an appeal that extends now a century and a half after slavery's abolition. The appeal, I think, is this. When we place our faith in something like democracy and expect that it will, it will deliver to us perfect liberty, perfect equality, or perfect community, our faith will never be perfectly upheld. At any given moment, we may see an event that shakes our faith in perfect democracy or even shatters it. When this occurs, the faithful might, like Garrison, decide that it is time to burn everything to the ground. The only solution that I see is this. We must defy the 1619 Project. And borrowing from Abraham Lincoln, we must let the anti-slavery Constitution be taught in schools, in seminaries, and in colleges. We must let it be written in primers, spelling books, and in almanacs. We must let it be preached from the pulpit and proclaimed in legislative halls. And in short, we must let it become the political religion of the nation. This, I think, is our Constitution's last best hope. Thank you. Amen to that. Thank you, Professor Ross. And, you know, in an earlier panel here, uh, Professor Diana Schaub gave a presentation on Frederick Douglass, who makes the same argument that the original Constitution, before the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments, that the original Constitution is, to quote Douglass, a glorious liberty document, unquote. The 1619 Project, if you read the 1619 Project, Frederick Douglass is virtually invisible in its account, which makes sense because if they included Douglas, the whole 1619 project would have been dismantled before it started. Thank you, Professor Ross. And now we turn to Professor Fornieri. Professor Fornieri, let me read the prompt here, the quote from the 1619 project and then ask for your rebuttal. 1619 project writes, quote, like many white Americans, Lincoln opposed slavery as a cruel system at odds with American ideals. But Lincoln also opposed black equality. Lincoln believed that free black people were a quote, troublesome presence, unquote, incompatible with a democracy intended only for white people. Quote, free them and make them politically and socially our equals, he asked. My own feelings will not admit of this. And if mine would, we well know that those of the great mass of white people will not." Unquote. Professor Fornieri. Thank you so much. I'm honored and, and delighted to be here. I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak. Uh, I must say as a part-time blues musician, I was, I was disappointed I couldn't be in Austin. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the home of, of uh, Waterloo Guitars and Stevie Ray Vaughan. Uh, so I hope we at some point we have a reprise. Um, I want to thank David Randall and I want to thank the, the Texas uh, Public Policy Institute as well as the National Association of Scholars. Um, I want to get uh, right to the point given, given uh, the limited amount of time uh, that we have. And, and so let me take up the assertions. Um, you mentioned the, the first, you quote the first assertion, like many white Americans, Lincoln opposed slavery as a cruel system at odds with American ideals. What struck me uh, the first time I read this is that the statement includes uh, several major propositions that contradict the author's thesis, uh, that the that slavery was the very founding uh, or foundation of our regime. And this was a regime that was dedicated uh, 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 on the principle of, of white supremacy, of white people by pe white people and for white people. It concedes that many Americans, white Americans, including Lincoln, oppose slavery as cruel. Um, how could this be if, if our nation was irredeemably uh, racist um, and white supremacist? To the contrary, uh, also, I, I think it's, it's, it's factually uh, uh, problematic in the sense that most Southerners didn't see slavery as cruel. And this is a brute fact that needs to be taken into consideration, uh, but is a blessing to both master and slave. Uh, and unfortunately, far too many Northerners were indifferent to this cruelty. Think of Stephen A. Douglas, for example, and the doctrine of popular sovereignty. Uh, two, 
the, the proposition concedes that slavery was at odds with American ideals. How could this be if American uh, ideals uh, were profoundly racist and excluded blacks? And now for the next assertion, um, uh, but Lincoln opposed black equality, okay? A vague statement. What does this mean? Um, and, and this is often uh, brought up today that, that uh, because Lincoln was not for full social and political equality before the Civil War, he somehow uh, falls short and his greatness is diminished. Um, how could Lincoln have devoted his life to resisting slavery and yet oppose black equality? The author refers to Lincoln's remarks in his Peoria speech of October 16th, 1854 about freeing slaves and then making them politically and socially uh, our equals. And I think the key words here are politically and socially. In American public law at the time, there were three kinds of rights, inalienable rights, uh, which proceeded from the hand of the creator, uh, civic rights, rights of citizenship, and political rights, uh, which, which is tantamount to, the, to suffrage. Uh, civic, that is, social and political rights, were left to the discretion of the states. After condemning slavery extension in the strongest terms in the Peoria speech, um, and of course, these passages are omitted. Lincoln then here acknowledges the difficulty of dealing with the existing institution of slavery. We should note that cons in, in constitutional terms, uh, the Constitution had established a firewall between the federal government and the existing of institution in the states, preventing any federal interference with it. This is a very uh, important legal conundrum and, and problem that seems to be omitted in the discussion, the rule of law. The territories were a different matter since they fell uh, under the jurisdiction of the federal government. So in the context of 1854, uh, when Lincoln makes these remarks, it would have been political suicide in the state of Illinois to advocate full social and political equality for blacks which was something uh, at the discretion of the state governments. In fact, the state of Illinois had a black exclusion law passed only a few years earlier over, by overwhelming margins, about 70% and over, that barred, this is remarkable, that barred free blacks from even entering the state, prohibited them from voting, this is what is meant by political equality, and denied them of citizenship. And this is in the so-called free state of Illinois. So we get a sense of what Lincoln is up against here. Uh, he had to walk a political tightrope between being anti-slavery, yet avoiding the charge of radical abolitionism, which would have amounted to political suicide given public opinion in Illinois. Politics is the art of the possible, not the ideal. Illinois was not Massachusetts. <laughs> The passage also includes a qualification that leaves doubt in the reader's mind about Lincoln's own position. Lincoln says, my own feelings will not admit of this. You see, he's talking about uh, freeing uh, the slave and making them our equals. And then he immediately says that, uh, and if mine would, qualifies this, and if mine would, we know well that those are the great mass of white people will not. For those that have lived with Lincoln and studied him, this is a uh, uh, classic uh, uh, use of, of studied ambiguity. Here, Lincoln leaves open the possibility that the statement may not be his own personal views, but an accommodation to the political realities and racial prejudices of the time, which were very strong. Well, why would why would why would you even include the, the remark and if mine would? And Lincoln consistently does this in other speeches, these these qualifications. Today, today, we condemn the persistence of systemic racism. We see it racism is ubiquitous. While seeming to minimize the actual force of slavery in the 19th century when racism and white supremacy was firmly entrenched and protected. 
the criticism of Lincoln for not supporting full equality of blacks at the time, in my judgment, is a red herring. It's a red herring. It's often repeated that distracts us from the Herculean effort that it took to end slavery. Need I remind us that it took a civil war and 700,000 American lives to end this pernicious entrenched institution. Blaise, and, and it's also based on the flawed assumption that people in the 19th century would embrace overnight the mores today of an interracial society. Lincoln's strategy was to first gain recognition of the African-Americans' common humanity and the vindication of their inalienable rights. This was no small task given public opinion at the time. Just read the works of Stephen Douglas, read the works of John C. Calhoun, um, even the Northern abolitionists themselves as Michael uh, Burlingame has shown in his uh, voluminous uh, biography uh, uh, were, were tainted by racism if measured by today's standards. Um, uh, Pro-slavery doctrines and white supremacy had degraded blacks to a subhuman status. So the recognition of, of African Americans' uh, common humanity, the, their title to inalienable rights, and the inherent evil of slavery was a precursor to the extending of further equality, namely civic and political, uh, to African Americans. Now, this is before the war. In 1854, let's see if Lincoln walks the walk uh, when he becomes president of the United States. Um, to what extent does he advance black freedom? Um, uh, Lincoln as a statesman, we, we need to keep in mind, was dedicated to the rule of law. Um, and, and I think the essence of his statesmanship is found in his use of Proverbs 25 that uh, his task as a statesman is to preserve the apple of gold, which is the, the principles of the Declaration of Independence, enshrined or framed by the picture of silver, the Constitution. And uh, both are required. We live in a democratic society where the consent of, of, of the governed uh, is, a, is a prerequisite to legitimate government. Um, but Lincoln was implacably uh, anti-slavery. We see in his first inaugural address, although he acknowledges concessions toward slavery uh, under the Constitution, he also defies Dred Scott. And remarkably, in, in many passages, I think that, that people often omit uh, the passage, they focus on his uh, willingness to uphold the, the fugitive slave provision. But right after that, he suggests that he's willing to extend federal protection to free blacks under Article 4, Section 2, the Privileges and Immunities Clause. Uh, as Herman Belt says, that is a, a remarkable and progressive civil rights step uh, for the time in blatant defiance of uh, Dred Scott. Um, of course, um, the Emancipation Proclamation itself, which we could speak on, uh, we could speak of, uh, you know, for, for the next hour, was a, a momentous step in, in, in destroying slavery. And it, um, but also united to that was the recruitment of blacks in the Union forces. And this was traditionally a path to citizenship. Lincoln recognized this around the same time, uh, shortly shortly uh, after the preliminary uh, emancipation, uh, Lincoln's Attorney General Bates on November 29th, 1862, acknowledged that the federal government will recognize black citizenship. So here we have a movement, you know, from ending slavery towards extending the principle of equality further to include citizenship, uh, very important. Also, um, we know that, that prior to the war, Lincoln had um, supported compen uh, compensated emancipation with the consent of the states and colonization. Well, uh, he speaks of colonization 
I think is a is a uh, is a publicity maneuver uh, as a placebo for the forthcoming thunderbolt of the Emancipation Proclamation. But he really, uh, after the Emancipation Proclamation goes into effect, he drops all discussion of it. No federal money uh, is spent on it, aside from a, a relief effort to uh, to uh, rescue uh, some colonized blacks that were uh, <clears throat> colonized through private means. Uh, so that deed I speaks speaks I think largely the colonization the colonization efforts cease, um, the policy ceases, the rhetoric ceases. Uh, very decisively, in 1864, uh, Lincoln looks like looks like Lincoln will lose the election. Public opinion is turning against him, and he's under pressure, even from his campaign manager uh, Raymond, to revoke or rescind the Emancipation Proclamation, and he's unwilling to do this. He writes a blind letter conceding defeat. Uh, that that uh, reveals that he's willing to stand on principle and, if necessary, sacrifice political ambition to this uh, more uh, noble cause. Of course, Sherman's capture of Atlanta turns the tide and fortuitously ensures that Lincoln would win the election of 1864. When we talk about equality, when we talk about uh, uh, racism, we always need to, you know, I think to take into consideration in comparison to what? And we can just take a look at Lincoln's opponent in the 1864 election and the platform of the Democratic Party at that time for a striking contrast. Um, also, Lincoln in a private letter uh, supported at the end of his administration and before his assassination, limited black uh, suffrage under the reconstructed government in Louisiana. So now we have the, the end of slavery, we have a movement, uh, support for black citizenship, and now support for private support for black suffrage. Now keep in mind that prior to the 15th Amendment, uh, suffrage and citizenship uh, prior to the 14th Amendment was left to the discretion of the states. Uh, that would change with the 14th Amendment, would, would make citizen birthright citizenship. Um, uh, Lincoln's last public speech was an explicit endorsement of black citizenship, and ironically, Booth was in the audience. He was overheard saying that uh, this is the last speech Lincoln will ever make because of his support for black citizenship. Of course, he doesn't use the word black. And... Uh, uh, Booth considers this the last straw and says that he will run him through. I will run him through. And we have this on record from a witness. Well, finally, before I conclude, I want to call in my, my final witness, and that is uh, uh, the great Rochesterian. I never want anyone to forget he's from Rochester, New York. Frederick Douglass, who said this about Lincoln and Lincoln's strategy in advancing equality. Okay, he says this in December uh, 1865, uh, he writes this, uh, um, at, of course, this, this is after uh, Lincoln's, <clears throat> Lincoln's uh, uh, assassination. And he, the context of, of these remarks is that he was reflecting on, he was speaking of Lincoln's support for black suffrage uh, at the end of Lincoln's career. And so Douglas says the following, it was like Lincoln, he never shocked prejudices unnecessarily. Having learned statesmanship while splitting rails, he always used the thin edge of the wedge first. <laughs> and the fact that he used this at all meant that he would, if need be, use the thick as well as the thin. Whosoever else have cause to mourn the loss of Abraham Lincoln, to the colored people of, his, of this country, his death is an unspeakable calamity. So Douglas clearly recognized um, the nuances of Lincoln's statesmanship and Lincoln's strategy to advance equality. And that meant accommodating the racial prejudices of time. It meant taking into consideration the limits of public opinion. It meant upholding the rule of law, uh, especially given that uh, there were great suspicions of Lincoln before 
uh, the war that he was a, a radical who would run roughshod over the Constitution. Um, Douglas also said uh, after, after meeting with uh, Lincoln that he was the only white man he could talk to, uh, a colored man without assuming an air of condescension. Should be noted that Lincoln met with Douglas three times, and uh, the second time they met in August of 1864, Lincoln actually proposed a plan to Douglas to establish an armed underground railroad that would spread the word of the Emancipation Proclamation uh, uh, to, to the slaves and help assist them to freedom. And he did this, he, he confided to Douglas that he thought he was going to lose the election of 1864. And this was really a last ditch effort to try and, to try and bring more people to freedom. I think that speaks volumes of uh, Lincoln's uh, commitment to, to uh, equality. Now, I think that, that in conclusion, the Civil War provides us with a cautionary tale about the fragility of our union and, it's, and the universal principles for which it stood. I recognize, I appreciate the value of diversity, uh, but it should not eclipse our common humanity and the fraternal bonds of our union. Those bonds of union are continually assailed today as they are by the 1619 Project, and they require a spirited defense, and that's why I'm here. Lincoln's rare example of statesmanship, I believe, provides us with the moral and intellectual resources to confront these challenges and to preserve our union. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Fornieri. And I think you're concluding with uh, additional information about Frederick Douglass gives us another indication why he is studiously neglected by Hannah Nicole Jones. Um, we'll now turn to uh, individual questions for you, going back to Professor Gutzman. Professor Gutzman, in your view, what are the origins of the current attacks on the Constitution and on the American Republic? And then second, why should everyday Americans care? What are the origins of the attack? Uh, well, There's a long-standing unhappiness with the idea of, of, of less a fair based decentralized Republican society, especially in academia. But of course, from academia, you end up with um, the influence of academia being reflected in journalism and, and other uh, aspects of <clears throat> the world of arts and letters. And so I guess it's not surprising that um, there should be a coordinated attempt to undermine not just respect for the American experience and the American political establishment, political system, but also uh, appreciation not only in, in, the, in the sense of uh, positive understanding, but just a, in the sense of an understanding of America's history with problems of self-government. So <sighs> it, it is to a large extent, I think a reflection of the internal politics of the academy that we end up with this. Um, I've noticed last three or four years that various aspects of uh, the media have been kind of like a running uh, seminar in African American studies. You could turn on uh, ESPN in the afternoon and see programs in which uh, you'd hear kind of classic works of African American literature and, and um, resentful writings uh, in that vein, just parroted at length every day in a, in a very hostile kind of a way. Um, so I think there's, I think the, the bottom line is this really had its germ in the academy. And then there's the question, well, why did we end up with that? Uh, <laughs> My theory about that is, is maybe a bit abstruse, but I actually think this is an effect of 
the Vietnam War. I believe that many people who were opposed to the Vietnam War decided, well, one way to get a, an exemption was to go into the academy. Um, uh, that is a draft exemption. I actually had, when I was a, a law student at the University of Texas Law School, a professor, very prominent uh, liberal constitutional scholar who also had a PhD in uh, political science. And he told us one day in class that if the Vietnam War had lasted two more years, he would have gotten an MD. Uh, I, I think that actually uh, kind of <laughs> captures it. So you end up with a lot of people who they, they skew to the left, why they're trying to avoid going into the military. One way to avoid going in the military is going into academia. And I'm not saying this is the sole uh, explanatory factor in the in the real lurch to the left in academia in the last generation or two, but I think this this is an element of it. Um, and then we, of course, we can name particular individuals whose works have had an outsized influence, and are really in the same vein as the 1619 project. Uh, I won't name them, but I'm sure their names come to mind. So. Uh, people should understand that you didn't tell me you're going to ask me this, so this is off the top of my head. But uh, I think that I think that it goes a long way toward explaining how we ended up with this current. It, it's not that the 1619 project itself is the episode. It's that the 1619 project is an aspect of this current moment we're in. It's it's really bigger than this, although this is one manifestation of a larger problem, I think. Thank you, if you don't mind me, If you don't mind me jumping in on this point, the, one thing that, uh, that strikes me is that Americans today have a hard time looking back at Americans of the founding era and realizing that Americans of the founding era sometimes weren't even sure if Baptists and Episcopalians could get along. Or if anybody could get along with the Quakers. And we <laughs> take that for granted today. Uh, but then they, they didn't know that people who had different religious beliefs and commitments could coexist peacefully. Uh, they certainly didn't know and hadn't had the experience of blacks and whites coexisting peacefully, uh, especially given the context in which they had been related through slavery. Uh, and so for us, we have the experience now of uh, uh, more than two centuries uh, where we know that not only can uh, Baptists and Episcopalians get along, Blacks and whites can get along and coexist peacefully. Uh, but I, I think it's very easy and sometimes very tempting to, to look back at the past and, and be uh, surprised and even shocked that uh, people didn't know then what we know now. Uh, and we now have the experience of well over two centuries that they didn't have then. That's all part of the experiment in American self-government is that we as a people and American people over time learn along the way and we get better at the experiment, we hope. Thank you, Professor Ross. Uh, before we, uh, Professor Ross, we have a question, a uh, specific question for you. Before we turn to that, I would only add to what you and Professor Gutsman said. I think that the late uh, political science professor, Harry Jaffa, would agree with both of you. Uh, and in fact, in his uh, uh, book, The Crisis of the House Divided, which is an account of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, and for the audience, if you haven't read it, you should. Um, in his 1959 introduction to that work, 1959, he says that today, the academy is responsible for the ruling opinions of society. And then he says, given the intolerance and utopianism taught in the academy, this cannot help but to sp spell the end of constitutional democracy, mm. 1959. Okay, now the specific question for you, Professor Ross, how would you respond to those who say, and we hear this often, that because so many of the founders owned slaves, their anti-slavery words or even their anti-slavery actions ultimately mean nothing? 
Uh, it, it, it's a good question, and it's a, a question that I, I know um, uh, young people especially <clears throat> ask uh, a lot. And I, I think Professor Gutzman touched on this in, in, his, uh, in his talk. Um, my answer is that words and deeds are not always related, but you don't often have deeds without words. Uh, and so when, when you write down that all men are created equal, even if that doesn't describe the uh, complete political reality of the day, that gives you a, a moral, that gives you a principle uh, that you can approach. And, and that's how the Declaration has functioned uh, throughout American history and functioned in the context of these debates about slavery and uh, how whites and blacks ought to relate with one another. If we didn't have that principle, uh, we wouldn't ha if we didn't have it written down, we wouldn't have it to live up to. And, and so that's, that's how I would say it. Uh, it, it was a new principle uh, and it was a, 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 a principle that not everybody understood the implications uh, to and that not everybody was ready to embrace uh, as, as readily as we embrace it today. But without having written down that principle, even if they imperfectly lived up to it, uh, we would not have had the uh, progress uh, that we have had in terms of uh, um, uh, peacefully coexisting uh, um, across races. Thank you, Professor Ross. And I believe the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. certainly would agree with you in his 1963 I Have a Dream speech. He identifies the Declaration of the Constitution as a promissory note. That's right. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Professor Fornero, we have a question for you. Um, would you discuss in detail Abraham Lincoln's letter to Horace Greeley in 1863, in which Lincoln says that he would save the Union with slavery or he would save the Union without slavery, but that saving the Union was paramount? Yeah, that, I, that, that's a good question. And I, I taught at the secondary level. Um, and I was always somewhat troubled uh, by a, a question on the Regents exam that established a disjunction between the Union and Lincoln's anti-slavery views. Um, and I think that the, the, the allusion was to this letter to Horace Greeley, which if, you know, if, if one reads it uh, literally on the surface, it kind of conveys the impression that Lincoln was a cold pragmatist that, you know, uh, was unconcerned about the plight of African Americans or about slavery and that, you know, very much like Bismarck, he was a practitioner of real politic. Uh, but a more careful reading of, of the speech, uh, of the letter, and now that we have historical hindsight, uh, shows really reveals the, the nuances of Lincoln's statesmanship as well. In that speech, he says, my paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union. And it should be noted that in the speech, Lincoln's replying to Horace Greeley, who was uh, critical uh, of him in a prior editorial saying that Lincoln was uh, too much enthralled to the border states. And, and Greeley was urging an immediate uh, emancipation proclamation. So Lincoln replies to him. And of course, it's a way of Lincoln um, uh, at that time, influencing public opinion, right? There was no TV, so Lincoln was able to influence public opinion through these letters, which he well knew would be published uh, widely um, and digested. So he says his paramount object is to preserve the Union, which does not mean sole or only object. Um, and then he discusses the different scenarios. If I could preserve the Union by freeing... Um, all the slaves, I would do it if I could preserve the Union by freeing some and leaving others uh, in slavery. I would do it if I could free it by by if I could save the Union by freeing none. I'd do it like this. So he he discusses these different scenarios, and what we know now in hindsight is that uh, a draft of the Emancipation Proclamation was already written and revealed to his cabinet at this time, and of course, preserving the Union for Lincoln always means preserving the principles for which it stood. And that means a, a union dedicated to the apple of gold and the principles of the Declaration, which um, condemns slavery in the long term, 
Uh, finally, what's often omitted in this in this letter to Greeley is Lincoln's final remarks, where he says, "I have spoken here in regard to my official duty, not in a court, which does not change my personal wish that that all men everywhere could be free." You know, so you know he he. he I think this is this is an important. Um, preparation for the Emancipation Proclamation, that um, it, is, it is meant to assuage the border states uh, who are required to defeat the Confederacy, and that is the sine qua non of ending slavery. And yet, when read carefully through the lens of Lincoln's own political thought, uh, it doesn't change his long-term commitment to the destruction of slavery because that's what the union, the union is anti-slavery. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Flannery. Uh, this question is for all three of you, and let me preface it with this statement. It's been said that the philosophy taught in the classroom in this generation will be the philosophy practiced in the legislature in the next generation. Now, based on that statement, all three of you are in the trenches teaching current college students and tomorrow's leaders. Have you seen any changes over the years in your students' attitudes toward America? We'll begin with any of the three, this question is to all three of you, begin with any of the three. I was just speaking of it. I was just speaking of it that, that um, uh, and I love my students. Uh, um, I, I, uh, however, I think that uh, the level of civic literacy, for one thing, is you know diminished, and, and I think a lot of studies reveal that. And to the extent that there is a discussion of of government, I think it's it's students are are reading it through the lens of Howard Zinn, and you know the the uh, you know the ideologies of identity politics have um, made their way to the secondary levels, not only in in the colleges, and this is going to certainly influence students' perceptions of of their country, you know, um, you know, I think we see, we see anger, we see resentment, we see uh, people uh, feeling uh, grieved um, and it's, it's, it's boiling up right now. Well, there's, there's been years of, of, of preparation and, it, and it's interesting that, you know, many of the, we see many of those who are disenchanted uh, with the United States and see the United States, see our country is a, uh, a fascist regime, are, are members of the upper middle class. And so, you know, where are these notions uh, coming from? You know, this isn't, this isn't the proletariat. Uh, uh, so uh, I think it's, I think it's a, I think it's a, a, a deep concern um, that, you know, we, and I think that there's, you know, there's increasing, it's sad to say, I think, contempt for the social sciences or for the liberal arts uh, out there when, when we, you know, we, we desperately need uh, support to continue uh, the good fight because, you know, there, there's going to be increased cutting of uh, the social sciences in the liberal arts and students are going to be encouraged to, you know, go into math and science, which is fine. My father's a mathematician. Um, if that's your calling, however, it, you know the what remnant is left, what remnant is left, uh, and what legacy is left in terms of uh, in terms of teaching students. You know, I, I it, we're almost afraid to kind of uh, discuss or acknowledge love of country uh, or even gratitude for our country, and that doesn't mean a critical. Uh, blindness to the country's flaws by any means. But, you know, critical thinking should also involve appreciative thinking. Um, so I, I've seen, I've seen it changed and, and um, I, I, I'm, I'm troubled and I'm concerned about it. Let's just say that in my 20 years of teaching. 
Yes. Yeah, I think there's a, a greater sense, a greater sense of cynicism amongst young people today, and and even amongst people in the academy. Um, and I, I think that we are far more liable to judge our fellow citizens by the worst things yeah. in their uh, history than by the best things. And I see that we are doing that uh, now of our own history as a nation. Uh, so we're going to, to judge uh, the Constitution by uh, what most abolitionists called its pro-slavery exception and not by its anti-slavery principles. Uh, and we're going to judge uh, those delegates at the convention. So Dr. Gutzman talked in particular about Thomas Jefferson and, and all of the anti-slavery uh, uh, efforts that he advanced. Uh, but uh, we will look at Jefferson and say, well, but he owned slaves. And uh, so th th there uh, is this um, uh, greater tendency uh, to be cynical about the motives of people. Uh, we assume that we know what is going on in someone's heart or mind or soul, and it's evil and it's dark. Um, and and in, in a certain way, I, I tried to, to highlight this point in my talk, this was the heart of the argument that the Constitution was pro-slavery. We know what was in the interest and in the motives of the Southern delegates. And therefore, they never would have accepted the Constitution if it wasn't entirely uh, and thoroughly protecting their uh, right to property and slaves. They never said anything like that, but we know what was in their heart. Uh, and, and so th 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 there, there's this, um, this cynicism about uh, one another's motives uh, that I, I think has uh, reached uh, a, a troubling um, proportions today. And, and I, I think the 1619 project uh, is uh, representative of that. Uh, and, and it's a very concerning uh, trend. I'll say one more thing I just want to add here, and I don't want to take too, uh, too much time is I, I am troubled too. In, in the past, you know, I've been teaching at the college level 20 years, and I taught at the secondary level. Uh, I am concerned about uh, the restrictions on speech and the chilling effect on speech and, you know, the repercussions for, for voicing uh, a different opinion. And, 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 uh, and, you know, we talk about, we talk about standing up and we talking about, you know, confronting some of these dogmas uh, you know, there, there's a real concern if one confronts them too strongly you will be disciplined, right? And, you know, I think we all know what, 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 what I'm talking about. I mean, you know, a, a cursory look at the, at, the, at the news, you know, uh, would, would reveal uh, that the First Amendment is, is imperiled. And that's part of the problem too, you know, and we're dealing with, I think, you know, I think in, in, in Jaffa's time in the 1950s, there was, you know, there, there was a kind of, um, uh, relativism and a moral relativism that was debonair and fashionable. Now, the vacuum, that moral vacuum has been filled by a much more militant ideology. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, whether, whether we can trace it to Foucault or, or Marcuse uh, and, and some of these thinkers, it is, it is much more assertive and, and, and much more aggressive. And, you know, at its core, I think, is the denial of our common humanity. And when that goes, we're in trouble. All right. And I'll, I'll just point out um, that nobody in American history embraced the principle of free speech uh, more thoroughly than the abolitionists. Exactly. And, and, and they... I, that, that was a central part of their argument was we are going to be heard. Uh, we're going to use the pulpit. We're going to use the press. We're going to use petitions. We're going to exercise every part of the First Amendment. That's the heart of our strategy to stand up against, uh, against slavery.
And so now I see uh, folks on the left who uh, agree in principle with uh, what the abolitionists were going for, but who disagree entirely on the principle of freedom of speech. I mean, the argument is free speech has been has been weaponized to intimidate um, and silence vulnerable minorities. But yet, American history shows that those you know, those same minorities wielded free speech as a weapon to, of of their liberation. The Black liberation. civil rights movement of the fifties and the sixties could not have succeeded without a re robust protection of free speech. Yeah, and the court recognized that, and 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 certainly. Um, you know, expanded free speech to include uh, symbolic expression and other forms. Yes. But the first question was about uh, our students these days and whether things have changed. Uh, I've been teaching in post-secondary institutions for over two decades now, and I think far more commonly now than was the case at first, entry-level students come to me with just a long list of misdeeds that they think the United States has committed. And they have no, no idea of any kind of context. So for example, I, I saw a poll recently that showed people under age 25 thought by a large majority that slavery was an American institution. Mm -hmm. That is, they had no idea of the role that Anglophones actually played in the history of slavery in the world. They thought we invented it. So or at least if we didn't invent it, well, it was mainly an American institution. They tell them, well, really something like one out of every 28 people who came across the Middle Passage ended up in today's United States. Um, they're flummoxed, that's baffling, who knew? And uh, I think instructing people about the past has to have some kind of context in it. Um, so for example, you say George Washington owned slaves, well, he was born in a colony in which he was going to, in a, in a family in which he was going to inherit slaves and it was illegal to free them. Right. So he owned them. What, what moral, what would a moral man do? Well, he could sell them, which was actually a, a bad thing to have happen to you if you were a slave. So <laughs> you know, I get these kinds of, of, um, asseverations from students that this guy's a bad guy because X, Y, and Z, and we just kind of have to tease through even the most fundamental aspects of the reality that these people encountered and say, really, now how do you judge this situation? So in other words, it's as if they'd all been subjected to propaganda. It, it's, it's not that they don't know anything. It's you know, to borrow a phrase, what they know just ain't so. It's, it's, <laughs> It's not knowing nothing. It's actually worse than knowing nothing. Right. Good point. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I don't think this is an isolated phenomenon. I think it's extremely common that people coming out of our high schools these days are afflicted with this um, kind of mistraining they've had in, in understanding of the American past and understanding the American government and understanding American society or actually done in understanding the current state of our society, which remains preferable to virtually any other one in the world. So uh, it's very, it's a very unhappy reality, I think. It is. I agree. And, and, you know, the basis, the reason I asked this question of all three of you uh, here at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, uh, we began last summer and continued it this summer, a summer institute for Texas high school civics teachers. And um, last year, the first class, we had a teacher in Texas. The last time K-12 students get any instruction in the founding is eighth grade. Okay. So we had an eighth grade civics teacher tell the class that her experience has been that by the time students are middle school age, middle school age, they already come to class cynical about the American regime. And I was shocked and I said to the rest of the teachers, has that been your experience? And they all said, yes, and it gets worse every fall. Well, let me, let me tell you one little story that'll, that'll buttress the point you're making. My 
I have three children. My middle child just graduated from the University of Virginia. And when she was in the fourth grade, she brought home her first history essay assignment. The assignment was, you are Benjamin Banneker, write a letter to Thomas Jefferson about slavery, age nine. So it could have, now of course, she wasn't supposed to say, well, Benjamin Banneker was a free man and Thomas Jefferson was the person who hired the first free person ever hired by the federal government. No, that was not the lesson. So she was supposed to, to adopt the posture of instructing Jefferson about his immorality. That was what to do at age nine, yeah. Yes, and you know, like all three of you, I do not blame the students, far from it. No. Uh, no. I, blame, I blame the adults who are supposed to be in charge and, and oh. to teach them, teach them history. But that said, uh, the US Citizenship and Immigration Services Citizenship Test that all immigrants have to take to become American citizens. You only have to get six questions right out of 10. And there's a hundred question database that you can study. Now, the good news is 90% of immigrants pass it the first time. That's great. The bad news is that only 19% of native born Americans under the age of 45 can even get six out of 10 right. The blame for that seems to me to lie at the doorstep of our universities, right? I mean, this is cultivated ignorance. And, on, and in the face of such cultivated ignorance, specious claims such as those that characterize the 1619 Project are much more likely to be accepted. Or as Tocqueville said, a simple lie will beat a complicated truth any day of the week, right? Uh, we have some questions from the audience. Uh, first question here, and this is for all of you. And our audience member asks, what do you see as the best way of pointing out the very narrow view of human and societal behavior required in order to reach the 1619 Project's conclusions, given the overall documentation of human behavior found in the historical record? I'll, I'm going to answer that simply. Uh, it, it's easier for us to assume we know the truth without reading the text. And so I, I think maybe uh, one generation uh, assumed that uh, the, the truth was uh, all unvarnished good. And maybe there's been a reaction against that. And now the argument is the truth is uh, unvarnished bad. Uh, but uh, you're right, students should be reading the documents. Students should be reading the Declaration of Independence. Students should be reading the Constitution. Students should be reading the Convention. Uh, students should be wrestling with these questions on their own. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons why students are not being asked to read these resources. Um, and, and, you know, some of them are ideological and some of them are uh, having to do with uh, changes in uh, expectations put on schools. Some of them are related to uh, changes in funding for uh, history and civic education. Uh, but the bottom line is all students in a self-governing republic ought to know the documents and they ought to know where the documents came from and they, they ought to understand the origins and the arguments uh, of those documents and it's just not that way. No. Thank you. Any other comments on that? I think the doc, you know, reading reading the documents is 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 good medicine, as Jason said. You know, um, it's a it's a good prophylactic against uh, some of the ideologies, right? To go right to the horse's mouth. You know, you need you need context, but you know, if you get it right from the horse's mouth, you know, proverbially speaking, um, it goes it goes a long way. Um, you know, schools have tried, right, with the documentary-based questions, and, and but but of course, what you know, what are what are the documents they're using? You know, how helpful? Um, is it? I think you know, increasingly we've moved away from political history into social history, and not all social history is bad. It's it, you know, there's great parts of it, but you know, when you're talking about these momentous events in American history, it's you know, it's they need to know about their own government. 
Thank you. Uh, we have another question from our audience, which I will read. Lack of civic literacy and weak historical background knowledge, or what E.D. Hirsch calls cultural literacy, should trouble all of us in higher education. What can professors or organizations like the National Association of Scholars do to reach back to the secondary level and impact, improve this troubling problem? I've, well, I, go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say, um, I, I would love it if someone on this call ran for uh, their local school board. Uh, if, if someone listening today, someone who, who has watched um, uh, this conference throughout the week, I would love it if uh, one or two or 10 uh, of the people who have, have heard this conversation go out and run for local school board. I, I think that's a, a critically uh, important part. Um, and I, I think um, any time you get groupthink on a question, uh, it's probably time to rethink the question. And so I, I think largely over the last uh, 20 years, there's been groupthink in the, historic, the, the, the historical profession about the Constitution being pro-slavery. Uh, and uh, with very few exceptions, that's been the uh, general assumption uh, uh, amongst historians is that the Constitution was and was intended to be pro-slavery. And we need research on uh, the, the fact that uh, it, that wasn't actually the case. Uh, let, let's step back and rethink this question. If everybody is, is uh, coming to the same conclusion, uh, and that conclusion is becoming the present uh, premise of future research, then uh, we're, we're sort of in a, a, our own little bubble and we need to step back and uh, rethink how we're approaching this topic. Well, Thank I wasn't you. going to suggest running for the school board, but I do think there could be more parental involvement in actual curricular affairs. I, I've known people who've been on school boards and they're mainly concerned with budgets and construction and pensions and when's the next election I don't think they really tend to drill down to questions such as what kids in a push are being taught about the federalist, you know, so um, it may take more, it might take more effort actually to get to know what kids are being taught. But I, I think that in most schools, people would be surprised what their kids are being, or most school districts, people would be surprised what their kids are being taught. So, but another, I said, I had three kids, another one of my kids, when he was a senior in high school, asked his sophomore English teacher, are all the English teachers socialists? And she smiled and said, not all of them. So the reason he had come to this conclusion was that the readings list, he'd bring, he'd bring things he was reading in English classes home to me and say, it's just more of, you know, a hostility to private enterprise, but he's, got this on the brain. And after a while, he noticed that it was nothing but hostility to private enterprise. And so it was Upton Sinclair and, you know, it was just, just the same kind of thing all the time. And I am certain that people who are on the school board had no idea this is going on. So um, parents really through elected school boards can shape what their kids are being taught, but in general, they don't make any effort to do that. So that's that's something that one might try to do. One might mobilize one's fellows and uh, see what people are being taught in English class, or, or particularly nowadays, English tends to be both in high schools and in colleges, a highly ideological field. Um, and in, of course, in history and in Texas, in the government class, they have the senior year in high schools, you know, it, it varies from state to state, but the actual content is really a, a matter of public policy. And there's no reason why voters, citizens shouldn't be involved in it. The fact that your kid has graduated from high school doesn't mean it's not still your local public high school. And so this, of course, is people are hearing this and thinking, wow, big time sink. Well, no, it's not easy. No. But this is the kind of thing that needs to be done, I think. People need to pay Self -government more. Self-government is not easy. To curriculum, that's right. If you just allow 
the local teachers, the local products of uh, education colleges to decide what's being taught, well, I can tell you where this is going to end up. Yeah, so just, and, to, know, add, uh, just to add to your statement, Professor Gutsman, about the predilections of English teachers these days, I have a fellow political scientist uh, friend who has taught at an Ivy League university for at least the last 40 years. And he tells the story that when seniors come to him and say, uh, I wanna go to grad school because I wanna teach politics. He tells them, well, if you wanna teach politics, then you should apply to the English department because that's all they do. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. Someone else said something they wanted. Well, I, I just wanted to connect with Dr. Gutsman's point. Uh, it's a, a, a little bit ironic that we're here talking about the 1619 project. But uh, when I ask folks who are not involved in higher education or politics about the 1619 project or mention it to them, almost invariably they say, what is that? Right. So they, they haven't heard of it. Uh, but when many of them do hear about the sentiments articulated uh, in and by the 1619 Project. Uh, they hear about it when their kids are coming home from school or college mm -hmm. and saying, uh, mom, dad, you're racist. Mm -hmm. Mom, dad, this country is racist. And here are these parents. I, I've heard this recently from a number of different people, but I sent them to a good school. Right. They went to good schools. They went to a good college. And now they're telling me that I'm racist. And our, our I mean, this is serious business. Our relationship right. with our children is strained because they think that we're racist. Yes. But I sent them to a good school. And they don't know what's being taught to their children. Right. They right. assume that their, their uh, children's teachers and their children's professors have uh, their best interests and the best interests of society at heart. And uh, they, they have no idea uh, these kinds of um, pernicious doctrines that are being taught. Yes. Good. Tom, you, you, yeah, you had mentioned that um, you invite uh, secondary teachers uh, in Texas. And I think that that's, that's been one of, as a former secondary teacher, um, that's been one of my strategies is, is to try and bring together uh, scholars and and secondary teachers uh, to, to pro provide uh, in, in enrichment uh, for them and so that they can take it back into their class uh, and that they that they have the resources the intellectual uh, resources and the opportunity you know to discuss these matters uh, and get an alternative uh, perspective so we have the center of statesmanship here at RIT and so that's, I, I, I think that I've worked with secondary teachers through the Ashbrook Center um, as well. And they've just, there's so many dedicated uh, secondary teachers out there. And uh, my whole family, my, you know, my sister's a primary school teacher, my wife's a teacher, they're overwhelmed, you know, and, 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 and in many ways. Uh, and they're not, they're not all, you know, I, 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 I don't want to paint with a, too broadly to say that they're, you know, all ideological. Um, and so I think it's, it's important that we identify, you know, th those that are, are serious about teaching and provide them uh, with it, with enrichment and, and give them the, you know, the kind of the resources where they could, they could um, share this knowledge, just like what we're doing here uh, with their students, because, you know, unfortunately, I, I think Alan Gelzo had told me that the 1619 project now is being, it's been just, you know, picked up by thousands, right? Am I wrong? Thousands of school districts. Right. That's right. And so these, you know, these teachers are, are, are getting it and it's being foisted on them as part of the, uh, a part of the curriculum and there's no alternative. That's, right. uh, that's, right. that's, that's really hard for us to fight. How are we going to fight that? Uh, you know, yes, have parents, I, I agree, you know, have parents run for, uh, you know, board, the, for the board, but uh, well, we have to do our part, you know. Um, and, and just to connect with that point, um, teachers are asked 
to do so many things these days that are not teaching. Exactly. They have so many responsibilities that are not teaching that anything that makes the job of teaching easier, they're going to snap up. And so uh, you mentioned the Ashbrook Center and, and we, I, I have worked with the Ashbrook Center before and they're a great organization and they have great resources for teachers um, and uh, they, they should be funded at uh, 10 or 100 times the level that they are. Um, that kind of support and, and those kinds of resources are vital for teachers who don't have the time to focus on developing a new resource uh, and, and uh, a new lecture uh, for every class when they have so many other things that they are asked to do. And I think at, at some level, having an easy narrative uh, is attractive to teachers for precisely that reason. I don't have the time, I don't have the bandwidth Interesting. to get into yeah. the nuances for um, uh, each of these issues. But if I have a narrative that can hook my students, then I will get their attention. Yes. And an easy narrative is uh, the 1619 Project. They were all racist. Yeah. That's right. Uh, no, that's I think these, the, the organizations, the Ashbrook Center, your organizations, I think they're, they're you know, it's important to form a union, especially in view of what's, of what is what is occurring today. There has to be some counter pressure you know as, as franklin said you know if we don't stick together we're going to hang separately i think that's true i think that's true and 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 that would mean you know part of it is the uh, exposure to the light of day exposure of the ideology to the light of day uh um would 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 go far i think for people of goodwill and i believe they're still out there but um you know, I, I I would encourage more more conversation and greater a greater concerted effort uh, to to influence secondary teachers as a counterbalance here, and that doesn't you know, and that means people with all diff, all different views, of course, diversity of uh, of, of of opinions if it's backed by facts. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. Yes. We only have about three minutes left, so let me read to you one last question addressed to all three of you. And this is a really a rubber hits the road question. Our audience member says, I have the opportunity to speak with a candidate running for the position of state superintendent this evening. Can each of you give me one item I might address to her? <laughs> is it your opinion York? on the 1619 project? <laughs> Yeah, that, that was, uh, what, what, what is your view on the 1619 project? Uh, should it be taught in school? Should it not be taught in school? Yes, good. Uh, um, just to follow up on that, I would ask the opinion, uh, ask this, this candidate what her opinion is of Abraham Lincoln's assertion that civic education should teach reverence for the Constitution and laws. Mm -hmm. Is teaching reverence for the Constitution somehow unscientific today? Mm -hmm. I, that would be a question I would ask. And is teaching reverence for the Constitution, uh, does that mean teaching unqualified uh, support? Yes, that right. mean not asking questions about it? And I don't think that it does. Yes. We, we can ask questions reverently, and I think that we ought to, and our students ought to be taught to do that. And that's an important part of becoming a citizen. Yes. Well, another way to put it is that although the three of us, the four of us, are opposed to this thoroughgoing critique of the American regime, the fundamental uh, attack on the American regime, we don't think that it's flawless. We don't think there's nothing to be improved. Right. The, the, the right. thing is that we know that it's much better than what came before it and that it's preferable to virtually any other ex yeah. regime extant now. So. Yeah. Besides that, we know that we can influence it if we try. Yes. And now, that was part of the point I tried to make in my talk is that they had been through a grueling 88 days trying to hammer out a new frame of government. And everybody lost something that they thought should be in there. And uh, 
I, I think everybody was equally unhappy with uh, some facet of the Constitution, but we have to make the best of this. And that's what self-government is all about. Uh, it's not going to be perfect. Uh, I'm not going to be perfect. N none of my fellow citizens is going to be perfect, and we'll all be imperfect in our own ways. Well, speak but for yourself. We have to make it work. <laughs> we found the one. <laughs> uh, I would ask her, uh, I would say, uh, I would ask her kind of point blank, do you see an erosion of free speech and of the First Amendment and uh, in education in our country at, at large? And, and uh, if so, what would you do to protect diversity of expression? Yes, that'd be an excellent question. That is a good question. Yes. Well, I am sorry that we've run out of time because I know that I speak for our entire audience when I say thank you very much to all three of you for your very thoughtful presentations. And I would also uh, remind our audience that there will our next panel is part of the last day of our week-long conference will be tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern, 10 Central, eight uh, uh, Pacific time. And there, there will be a panel called Let America Be America Again. Again, thank you to our panelists and thank you for your- Thank attention. you. We'll see thank you in you. Rochester as soon as this clears. Sounds <laughs> good. Thank you. Bye, Bye folks. Thank you. Nice to, nice to see everybody again. Keep up the good work. I enjoyed all your talks. Same here. Thank you. I want to get copies of them, but take care. Okay.